So hi everyone, welcome to the seventh episode of the Green Left Show and thanks for joining us um, for a discussion on the Federal Government's anti-union omnibus bill legislation. Um, before we introduce our speakers and get started, we should acknowledge that we're meeting on stolen land. For myself, I'm hosting from Waterong Country. We pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge that it always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, so tonight's uh, guest speaker is Tim Gooden. Tim, thanks for joining us. G'day, Sarah. How are you going? Pretty good. Um, so Tim um, is a lifelong unionist, um, former secretary of Geelong Trades Hall Council um, and currently a shop steward for the... Um, construction division of the CFMMEU. So great to have you on board. Um, so I guess to kick things off, um, what's your view on the omnibus bill legislation and its potential impact on workers if it passes? Oh, it's, it's pretty huge. It's pretty huge, Sarah. I mean, there hasn't been a piece of legislation like this since um, uh, Fair Work and um, Work Choices. It, uh, it really does set up a lot of workers um, uh, to be able to restrict their em employment conditions um, and what say they have and what, what say unions have uh, in, in, in the workplace. And uh, it's pretty clear that the government is listening to the big end of town. They're trying to fix some things that were developing, that had developed in common law around the definition of a, a, a casual. Uh, for years, we've been saying that the bosses are, are ripping people off by treating them like a permanent, but paying them as a casual. Uh, the courts in the last four years have um, uh, not only said that that is the case in, in certain cases, um, but there was uh, compensation and back pay uh, to, to those workers. Um, the, the bosses have been caught out and they've freaked. They've gone to the federal government and said, we've got to fix this. And this piece of legislation, the centrepiece of this, is the ability for bosses to be able to call someone a casual. That will be the main style, the main piece of evidence that determines that they're a casual, um, and uh, and just and ha and essentially have them working full time um, uh, as permanent employees um, while not having the long term obligation of um, holidays, sick leave. Uh, etc. So it, it is a real problem. 60% um, of jobs that have been created in the last 12 months have all been uh, casual. Um, we're already a very the highest in the OECD in terms of our casualisation rate in, uh, in the Australian workforce. And this is further going to entrench what the bosses have always loved, is just having a casual on the books. Um, they, they never have to sack them because all they do is they just don't call them in. So there's no unfair dismissal. They don't have any uh, holidays, sick leave, anything like that. Um, they'd like to get them on zero hours as well. That would be the next thing. They probably did ask for that, but um, I think the, the bosses are pretty happy now that um, they don't have to worry about the federal court decision on definition of what is the casual, if this piece of legislation gets up. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, as we mentioned, you're a carpenter by trade working in construction, and we know that the, the CFMMEU is a union that the federal government loves to target and go after. Um, is there anything um, coming up as part of this package that will have a specific in, impact on your industry compared to others? Well, any, any industrial law... Um, once it sets a precedence and becomes a norm, will have an impact on um, all workers, uh, in, including ourselves. And um, we're the better organised in our workplaces and, and have very good uh, conditions and um, uh, wages, etc. But of course, the, the further down the rest of the workforce is pushed, then the harder it is for organised unions uh, to make gains for, for their members. So even if there isn't a direct impact immediately on our workplaces, um, the, the definition of uh, casual is still going to have an impact. Uh, Eight-year Greenfield agreements uh, will, will have an impact. Um, the, the flexibility, the, the, the ability for the employer to direct people 
um, to, to, to work outside of the, the, the scope or their role, mm. uh, as long as it's within their, their skills and capabilities, um, that, 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 could have a, that could have an impact. Um, the amount of time that workers will have and the information that they get in terms of seeing an agreement or being part of an agreement, um, that, that could have an impact. And then we've still got all the things that are hangovers from uh, fair work, um, the ability for the bosses to strike up non-union agreements, um, the ability for them to get agreements with just a couple of people before they go and hire the rest of the workforce. Um, you know, there's, there's all those things that already existed. So mm -hmm. this would just have a compounding impact um, and um, make it easier for the bosses to um, rip off workers. Absolutely. Um, and the other piece of anti-union legislation we've seen recently, um, you know, would have given us whiplash with how quickly it went through Parliament was the demerger bill. Um, and again, it does seem rather targeted um, at the CFMEU. Um, can you comment on the demerger bill and, and how you think it could potentially impact on your union? Yeah, well, well only, only the things that um, I've heard that most people have heard in the, in the public arena. Um, you know, the, 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 the mining division has allegedly um, had meetings with the government yeah. um, and that they, they wanted it. But the piece of legislation itself applies to all unions. Um, it applies to all workers. And um, it, it is a bit troubling that the government is passing legislation that will that could weaken unions. I mean, any any unions that are smaller or separated or isolated um, makes them weaker, and therefore the, the, the members could uh, miss out. Um, I think in, uh, in in our case, uh, it probably won't have an, an immediate impact on our members, but our ability to operate on a national scale on big campaigns on, on some of the bigger questions that affect all workers um, it does make it more difficult when you're not part of when the, the unions are separated and um, uh, and of course there's all the questions of uh, resources uh, sh sharing access to IT technology media you, you name it um, obviously and that's why companies do it. Yeah, the, 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 the bigger the company, um, the more impact that you can have. And, um, and I think that unions are the same. So it's not, not, it doesn't surprise me that the government uh, j jumped to this quickly yeah. and got it through um, without anyone noticing. Absolutely. Um, and I think you mentioned it at the start, but there has been a lot of comparison of this um, anti-union omnibus bill to the work choices legislation that um, Howard tried to introduce. Um, and you were involved in the Your Rights at Work campaign um, at the time as Secretary of Geel at uh, Geelong Trades Hall. So I guess what similarities do you see between what Howard tried to introduce then and what Morrison is trying to introduce now? Um, well, Howard did introduce it, they, they yeah. got it up. Um, the, the, the it was a two year campaign to get rid of Howard, yeah, uh, and then put the asset on the ILP to get rid of the legislation, which they they didn't fully do, yeah. Um, and uh, in, in many ways, the, the fundamentals of it being um, st stayed the same. So Howard managed to take away the uh, IR laws away from the Arbitration and Conciliation Act, which is under the head of powers in the constitution um, and move it across to corporate law. He managed to take the unions out of the process and put the individual worker forefront as the legal entity. Um, the rest of us just became uh, parties to an agreement, if you like, or, or bargaining agents. And uh, it didn't specify a union had any more right than a Salvation Army officer or a solicitor or a girl guide around the corner. Um, if that was the bargaining agent, then they had all the same rights. So unions lost their arbitrary ability to um, be recognised as an entity um, and to essentially enter the workplace um, and to organise the, the unorganised. And um, that's still the same 
but that's still the same today. So that that did get up. Um, what we're over, able to achieve over a two-year campaign is to completely get rid of that government. And John Howard was the second Prime Minister in Australia to actually lose his seat at a federal election. Um, now, I, the key differences between not so much the legislation themselves, they were, um, they're both fundamental changes um, to the way that the law operates, the, what the Fair Work Commission can do, the definitions, the power balances um, that get handed over to the bosses. What is different in, in the um, Your Rights at Work campaign um, was that we did set the agenda on education. Everybody knew what was in that legislation and what it meant. People were starting to be affected by it. Um, we, we set that media, media agenda, um, not just through lo lobbying of uh, uh, senators and, and Facebook campaigns. Um, the Facebook wasn't even a big deal in 2005, 2006, um, but everybody, that you spoke to in Australia knew exactly what was going on and where they stood. Um, and as, as you know, by the 2007 elections in uh, that November, um, most people were opposed to it and, and ultimately a Labor government was elected uh, out of that process. So um, this time around, very few people know about the Omnibus Bill. Mm. Um, very few can pronounce it. Um, some of the <laughs> Facebook campaigns uh, etc. is just uh, stop the bus. Um, and people don't actually know the content and how it could affect them on a, on a, on a daily basis. But that wasn't the case in the 2007 campaign. Everyone knew what was they were in the gun and what, what it meant for them mm. personally and in their hip pocket. And um, uh, they keep on saying that this piece of legislation will simplify things. Um, it, it, it won't. It, in, in fact, there's more secrets because the, the employer doesn't have to provide information to workers when they're voting on an agreement um, and so forth. Yeah. And, uh, and the, the time lags uh, are in the uh, employer's favour um, rather than the employees and the unions. And uh, we can't scrutinise, unions can't scrutinise a, um, a non-union agreement and other unions can't... Um, appear in the commission and interject in, a, in a, an agreement that they haven't been involved in negotiating, even if they're normally their union members' coverage, um, a union can in intervene and get involved in it. But in this case, this legislation as it stands at the moment would rule that out um, and also weakens the power of the, of the courts, or particularly the, the Fair Work uh, Commission, mm -hmm. in fact, some of those rulings. Um, like the boot test, which is the um, better off overall test. Um, some of that's been taken out um, of, of the most recent tabling of the document, um, but it's got a two year limit on it. So eventually, eventually it will come in and eventually it will be normal, um, a normal IR law if, if it passes the Senate next week. Yeah. And um, the, so the Your Rights at Work campaign mobilised thousands of workers um, union members around the country and, as you say, ultimately toppled um, the Liberal government at the time. Um, what do you see as some of the strengths of that campaign in 2007? Um, definitely the, the involvement of rank and file. So not just in the five big rallies um, that were had over that 18-month period, but there were thousands and thousands of workplace uh, visits um, here in Geelong, we took delegations of workers to the, the, the local member who lost his seat um, uh, to, to their office, both in formal meetings and also in, in protest meetings. We had um, little meetings outside of um, every workplace. Sharon Barrows used to come down to Geelong at 7.30 in the morning and um, we'd be outside workplaces waving the flag and had big billboards and we had lots of involvement of the rank and file. They, they felt part of... Um, the campaign. They had lots of information. There were TV ads. Um, and so when we did call them out on the street, they were already mobilised, and not only physically, but in their mind. They knew what the arguments were. They knew which side of the fence they stood on. And when you said, come to a rally, they, they knew that that was the right thing and the right time to do it. So 
Um, so there's a very high level of um, active involvement of the rank and file. Um, and that, that took enormous amounts of work um, by all the leaderships at the time. And, um, but it, it proved a very successful uh, com combination. Absolutely. And I think you sort of alluded to this, but I've um, heard it commented previously that the um, fair work legislation introduced under the Kevin Rudd government was work choices light, in quotation marks. Um, I guess, what are your views on that statement? And, you know, given that there was a campaign that toppled a government, um, where do you think that campaign went wrong right at that end mark that we still ended up with legislation that wasn't ideal or what unions wanted? Yeah, I remember at the time, like, everyone was really excited. Um, we obviously locked off a government. That was the end of it. We were going to be able to uh, fix it all. A lot of the agreements that had been signed did get carried over. Um, a lot of them still exist today, like 12 years later, some of those agreements mm. still exist. Um, uh, zombie agreements that have just kept plodding on. Um, the, uh, the, the fundamental things like being underneath the corporation's head of powers under the constitution rather than the arbitration conciliation, that, that didn't change. Our ability to enter workplaces and organise the unorganised, um, that, that didn't change. Little, little things changed, like it was, it was under the old legislation, work choices legislation, it was a $36,000 fine uh, for individuals. That got reduced down to a $12,000 fine. So the marginal improvements um, all, all the way around. Um, Non-union agreements didn't get taken out. Um, the... Some things that remain that make it difficult is you, you, the, the bargaining periods, uh, getting getting employers to the bargaining table, the 50% um, plus one rule. There's a, the whole range of things that were developed in work choices that just carry through. Um, and it's that type of legislation that continually makes it hard for unions today. And then... So with the hard rules, and then they go and bring in things like the ABCC for, for my industry, um, where they just prosecute you every time you look at a member, um, uh, the, our union gets more fines, you know, and, uh, and they, they call that illegal behaviour. Um, but all the bosses that are operating under sham contracting, ripping off workers, um, not providing safety equipment, the, the dozens of little things every day, no, that, that's not operating illegally or breaking the law. That they're, they're just good, hard, honest businesses trying to make um, ends meet as the government tries to portray them. Absolutely. Um, so the omnibus uh, legislation has already passed in the House of Representatives and um, last I read my emails from Sally McManus, it's assumed that it will be going to the Senate for a vote next week. Um, what are your views um, on the campaign that has been run so far by the ACTU? Yeah, well, first off, in terms of the timing, yes, it is supposed to go before the Senate next week. Um, there's two, the government is saying that without Christian Porter, they've given it to Michaela Cash and she's going to take it through the Senate regardless. I did hear a senator early this morning saying, well, we're not negotiating with anyone other than Christian Porter, so it won't be getting tabled. Um, and the crossbenchers, that was a crossbench senator. Um, and I'm sure there's a bit of bolstering, um, you know, people negotiating and trying to get a bit out of it for themselves. But if it does go before the Senate this week, and if it is, if it does get up, it'll be, a, a really sad indictment on our ability to be able to muster a campaign at the moment. Um, the letter writing and the petitions and the callings um, to senators, and, and I, I've, I've been part, I've been part of that. Just you know, we get asked to send stuff off to them and sign petitions and so forth, and ring them. Um, I, I think all that's been quite good, and I'm sure. The crossbenchers are aware of what the issues are, and I think the national leadership and the unions have done um, a, a good job on that front. Um, what's not apparent um, 
is the education level of, of workers um, as to how this could impact them. I think I think we need to do a lot more on that um, to start getting them up to speed. Um, and the the general backlash as is perceived in the media um, by workers is without a campaign on the streets um, and without workplaces sending messages back through their employers that they've pushed it too far, that they're biting off more than they can chew. There's going to be a bad luck, bad backlash on, on this over the next coming uh, 12 months. That message and that fear isn't with the employers at the moment. They're, they're full of confidence. Um, you know, so there's a few petitions and some Facebook memes and a couple of posters and um, maybe the cross benches will get something out of it for their own states. Um, but at the moment, the, the employing classes aren't at all um, concerned. In fact, they're quite confident that they'll get most of what they want out of that legislation. I guess, I mean, in the absence of a coordinated, you know, education campaign or feed on the street campaign, what would your advice be to rank and file members or delegates that are across this issue? Um, what should they be doing in their workplaces at the moment? Well, um, last week um, at Geelong Trades Hall, I moved a motion from the floor and that was passed unanimously. Um, first off, that we we do whatever we can to educate as many people in, in Geelong or our immediate sphere of influence as to this piece of legislation, whether that be through press releases, workplace meetings, posters, banners, etc., stunts, whatever it takes. Um, uh, second, that there should be in Victoria, um, a mass delegates meeting where we can all speak and, and not a stage show, but a proper delegates meeting where we can work this out and, and move forward. Um, now, given the short time frame, ultimately you'd want to lead up to um, uh, getting a big public campaign uh, going um, and an industrial campaign. If this does go through, we also pass the third thing that we pass. If this does go through, we should immediately hold rallies and protest outside the local Liberal MP's office um, to say that this is not acceptable. Just because it's COVID and the government slipped it through amongst all the other things of vaccinations and everything else that's going through people's minds, um, no, that's good enough. That's not good enough and we won't accept it. Absolutely. Thank you. I guess any other um, comments you'd like to make on the bill or unions yeah, there's generally? Lots of, there's lots of little insidious things like part-timers. Um, part-timers will now be able to be forced to work up to full-time, 38 hours, without any overtime. Um, uh, casuals are already... Um, work up to a full permanent week um, and on, ongoing. The underpayment stuff that the government's touting is, you know, trying to address the, the stolen wages or wage theft, um, that, uh, that's got such big holes and get outs in it. Like you would have to prove to, for a criminal conviction, you'd have to prove uh, dishonesty and intent of the party to rip someone off. Um, and as in criminal law, that is incredibly difficult to prove that in a person's mind, they were um, operating uh, dishonestly and, and with intent. Um, there's lots of little things you can do to get out of stuff. One-off rip-offs won't be included in it. Uh, so if you didn't pay someone maternity leave, if you didn't pay them there, you sacked them just before they were due for their long service leave. So stuff like that, they're, they're one-off things, so they won't be included in it. Um, and uh, I think it sounds tough. It sounds tough, but the reality is it'll be almost impossible uh, to, to, to get a conviction. And um, the and other little things that I said before, the union's not been able to intervene in, the, um, in an agreement that's been worked out with, with workers. The bosses will be able to go straight to... Um, uh, a part-timer and have a simplified agreement. So it's, it's verging on the old Howard individual agreements. So individual agreements were registered and they were a separate agreement and they were secret. Um, 
but now it's allowing for additional things, flexibility, more flexibility in the workplace, go, go and do this job, go and do that job. No, you're not supposed to. Um, that's not part of your normal role. That's not what you're employed here for, but we want you to go and do it anyway because we're, we're suffering in COVID, all that sort of stuff. The, all those, that ability to negotiate individually with workers starts to break down the whole workplace agreement pit workers against workers, because some workers will do it, some workers won't, some feel that they have to, et cetera. Um, but it also removes the, the union out of that picture. And uh, that's the weakest position that workers can be in. That's what John Howard tried. Yeah. Um, and this piece of legislation has that woven through it all the way through, even though there's no specific clause there that, um, like the old individual agreements, but the whole theme is woven through so that employers can get you on as a casual, pay you the minimum, not have any long-term liabilities or entitlements, um, and they can get rid of, in, for part-timers, for instance, they can get rid of their overtime, so up to 38 hours a week. So it's becoming quite a... Um, there is a lot more into it than, um, than what's being put out there in the media, and... Um, and I think that's why we need to have these, um, we need to have lots of workplace meetings. We need to have mass delegates meeting to, to get right to the guts of this. Um, then we need to be able to, um, once the, there's a clear understanding of what we're facing and there's some indignation from workers, then we need to be able to um, whip that up into a campaign and start fighting back. At the moment, it's a cross your fingers and lobby the cross benches and hope for the best. Uh, that may work. That may work. Uh, but if it doesn't, um, then we're in for, workers in for a hell of a time over the next five years. Absolutely. I get, get ready to mobilise. <laughs> um, well, Tim, thanks so much for joining us um, on the Green Left show. And thanks to our viewers for watching our seventh episode. And we should remind everyone that Green Left, it's in its 30th year of production. And if you're not already a supporter of Green Left, we really encourage you to go to greenleft.org.au and become a supporter um, and help us continue this project.